Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Committee for Justice's virtual panel discussion on Google versus Oracle and the constitutional foundations of intellectual property. I'm your host, Ashley Baker, and I am the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. I'd now like to introduce the panelists and the order in which they will be speaking. Kurt Levy is president of the Committee for Justice. He has expert he has expertise in constitutional laws, civil rights, and fe the federal judiciary and intellectual property, and co-authored a Supreme Court brief in the Google versus Oracle copyright case. After graduating Harvard Law School with honors and clerking for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, Mr. Levy served as Director of Legal and Public Affairs at the Center for Individual Rights, after which he headed the Title IX Policy Group at the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. Before attending law school, Mr. Levy earned undergraduate and graduate degrees in computer science from Brown University. Subsequently, he worked as a scientist at HNC Software in San Diego, California. At HNC, Mr. Levy designed and built numerous AI systems, published peer reviewed articles about neural networks, and invented and patented pioneering technology for adding expert system like capabilities, most important, explanation of results to multi layered neural networks. Ultimately, his invention became a key part of HNC's neural network products, most notably the Falcon credit card fraud detection system that expanded the use of artificial intelligence in the financial industry and is still used worldwide today. Seth Cooper is Director of Policy Studies and is a Senior Fellow at the Free State Foundation. His work on federal communications and technology policy at the Free State Foundation began in 2009. Mr. Cooper previously served as director of the Telecommunications and Information Technology Task Force at the American Legislati Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. Mr. Cooper served as a judicial clerk to the Honorable James Wilson at the Washington State Supreme Court. He has worked in law and policy staff positions at the Washington State Senate and at the Discovery Institute. Mr. Cooper is a 2009 Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute. With Randolph May, he is co-author of Modernizing Copyright Law for the Digital Age, Constitutional Foundations for Reform, which I actually have right here and would recommend. Um, just wanted to point that out. Um, yeah, we're you. on the shopping channel now. Um, he has, they have their first book, Modernizing um, Copyright Law for the Digital Age, Constitutional Foundations for Reform, and the previous book from 2015 is Constitutional Foundations of Intellectual Property, a Natural Rights Perspective, both published by Carolina Academic Press. Mr. Cooper's work has also appeared in such publications as Com Law Conspectus, the Gonzaga Law Review, the San Jose Mercury News, Forbes.com, and the Des Moines Register, the Baltimore Sun, Washington Examiner, Washington Times, and elsewhere. Mr. Cooper earned his BA degree in political science from Pacific Lutheran University and received his JD from Seattle University School of Law. And last but not least, we have Professor Adam Mossoff. Adam is Professor of Law at Antonin Scalia School of Law at George Mason University. His scholarship has been relied on by the Supreme Court, by federal courts, and by federal agencies, and he has been invited numerous times to testify before the Senate and the House of Representatives on the proposed intellectual property legislation. His writings on intellectual property policy have appeared in the popular press, in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Forbes, The Hill, and in other media outlets. Mr. Mossoff is also a senior fellow and chair of the Forum for Intellectual Property at the Hudson Institute, a visiting intellectual property fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and a member of the board of directors at the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding. His articles can be downloaded, oh, sorry, I'm reading where his articles can be downloaded and you can found, find his um, articles on um, online um, and in the link that I, I sent you. Um, so just a few housekeeping notes. Um, if all the panelists could please um, turn your audio on mute so when you're not presenting, um, just so that the audio is, um, so that there's no interruption here. Um, also, I will have the Q&A function in Zoom open throughout the, entire, throughout the entire panel. So if any of the attendees would like to chime in with a question for me to answer at the end um, and go ahead and send it in, I can queue that up for you just to make things a little bit easier so that we can you know, transition to the Q&A segment um, a little bit more easily. The way we'll do this is each of the three panelists will present um, and then after each of their short presentations, there will be a discussion element um, amongst myself and the three panelists, um, followed by a Q&A from any audience questions um, that we, that you guys may have. Um, and Kurt, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, Ashley, I'm going to just give an overview of the uh, Google v. Oracle case and um, 
why I think Oracle should win. Uh, I'll include some of the arguments that um, the Committee for Justice uh, had in its uh, Supreme Court amicus brief in this case. Um, the case began when about 15 years ago, uh, Google set out to develop the Android operating system for smartphones, which you're probably all uh, familiar with, and it wanted to take advantage of um, developers' familiarity with the very popular Java SE uh, development platform. So um, it didn't get a license from Oracle, which owns Java SE. Instead, it copied um, over 11,000 lines of uh, declaring code. And I'll explain uh, in a moment what declaring code is, um, as well as copying the organization of the code, again, to make it familiar to, um, to developers. So Oracle um, sued for copyright infringement. They won twice in the uh, US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The first time it was on the issue of copyrightability and the second time on uh, Google's fair use defense. Um, under any straightforward analysis of the Copyright Act, um, Oracle wins here. I mean, no one disputes that um, computer code is protected under uh, the 1976 Copyright Act. Um, Google simply argues that uh, declaring code, that's the, the Java code that developers interact with to, uh, to invoke uh, Java's functionality, that that's not copyrightable, unlike the implementing code, which is used to implement that functionality. Um, it's a convenient argument because it's the declaring code that, that Google copied. You know, that's what you need to copy if you want developers to be familiar with it. Um, but there's no, there's no such exception or distinction in the Copyright Act. Um, Google um, then argues that somehow declaring code um, falls under the 102B list of exclusions for procedures, methods of operation. Um, and in a colloquial sense, you know, all computer code is a procedure, a method of operation. So that proves too much. Um, you know, if, if you follow that line of argument, computer code could never be copyrighted, but we know that's not what, what Congress intended. Um, Section 102B was simply meant to codify the longstanding principle that you can copyright expression of an idea, but not the idea itself. So if, if um, you know, Oracle were arguing that, um, uh, you know, it owned the idea of a platform like Java SE, well, they'd lose. Um, or even if they were arguing that they um, own the type of functionality found in it in Java SE, they'd lose. But that's not what they're arguing. They're just arguing that they have a copyright in the particular expression of, of that functionality, the particular code. And they own that expression uh, every bit as much as a composer owns the particular sequence of, of words and notes in a song. Um, there's a similar problem with an Another one of the main arg arguments Google makes, which is to invoke the merger doctrine, which says that sometimes um, the idea and the, the the idea is so functional that it can only be expressed in a small number of ways, and therefore the idea and the expression uh, merge. Um, that's really just a uh, a repeat of the uh, of the 102B argument. At the end of the day, Google's trying to say this is too functional to be expressive. Um, and granted, computer code isn't uh, poetry or art, but Congress knew that when it protected the code. Um, also, there's countless different ways that you could implement that functionality. Um, there's more than a few, and you know that's exactly what Apple did, for example, with uh, iOS. So the legal arguments don't work well for Google, so then they make sort of uh, policy arguments or utilitarian arguments, they say, you know, the Android operating system is, um, you know, we needed to copy it if we wanted it to be Google, I'm sorry, uh, Android to be interoperable with all the other systems out there. Um, and they also say we needed to copy it because developers are so familiar with it. But that's, you know, that really just comes down to um, to saying, look, this is, you know, Job SE is very popular and so we needed to copy it. And, and look, if I was developing a new search engine, I'd want to copy the look and feel of Google search, but you know Google would would sue me. And besides, they could have copied all this if they had obtained a license. Um, 
And again, there's no exceptions for interoperability or familiarity in the Copyright Act. Um, Google also makes other sorts of arguments about why the sky will fall if, uh, if Oracle wins, but they're policy arguments. They're not, they're not legal arguments. And it's been six years since uh, the first victory in the federal circuit and the software industry has just has done fine. The sky has not fallen at all. In any case, it's the Supreme Court's job and, and any court's job to interpret the act, not to engage in a free ranging uh, consideration of policy. Um, also, finding the best copyright policy involves balancing a lot of complicated and countervailing factors, and courts aren't good at that. Um, Congress, on the other hand, has done exactly that over the years as it's amended the Copyright Act, and it's done a good job. It's, you know, one of the few things that I think, uh, you know, where people think Congress has, has done a great job of, of legislating. So really, the audience for uh, Google's concerns is across the street in Congress, not in the Supreme Court. Um, our brief also discusses the constitutional uh, uh, basis for, for why Oracle should win, but I'm gonna leave that, uh, I've gone long enough, so I'm gonna leave that to my colleagues. Thank you, Kurt. And now that Kurt's kind of went over these smaller details uh, of the arguments that are being made in the case itself, I'd like to turn it over to Seth, who's going to give a bit of a broader overview of um, the constitutional foundations and natural rights foundations of IP and how we got to where we are today. Seth. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to the Committee for Justice for putting on these programs, especially in this time. It's, it's been a really uh, a wonderful public service. And I really appreciate uh, all the times I've tuned in and will continue to, to watch these programs. So yes, um, Committee for Justice's amicus brief in uh, Google versus Oracle did touch some on the, on the constitutional, uh, what I call constitutional foundations uh, for copyrights. And I'll, I'll discuss that here a little bit. Um, simply put, Copyrights are constitutional rights. People forget they're, they're in the Constitution. We have a copyrights clause in Article I, Section 8. And Randolph May, who's president of the Free State Foundation, he and I co-wrote a book called The Constitutional Foundations of Intellectual Property, A Natural Rights Perspective. And in that book, we looked at the philosophic uh, backdrop of the copyrights clause, how the American founders, that generation, would have understood copyrights and patent rights. And we also looked at the next couple of generations uh, after the founders, how they understood copyrights and how they enforced them through uh, legislation, through cases, how they discussed and analyzed them in legal treatises. And so we found that the view of the founding era and, then, and later jurists and statesmen such as uh, James Kent, Joseph Story, Daniel Webster, even on down to Abraham Lincoln, uh, they viewed intellectual property rights, copyrights and patents as, as natural rights in a person's labor and the proceeds of their labor. And so in a nutshell, the natural rights view of property is that our need, our, our capacity, our right to acquire, to use and transfer property, including the right to, you know, the, including the right to labor to create property, uh, that belongs to every person by virtue of their humanity. It's part of human makeup, the human nature, the human constitution. And so, you know, that view was prevalent at the founding and thereafter. And they brought that view directly to bear on copyrights. So if a man or woman labors to create a literary work, or in this case, a computer program or, or code of some kind, or arrangement of, of code, and that's an act of laboring. And it gives rise to ownership, to exclusive title to the property and its proceeds. And so just as the founding instituted government for the primary purpose of securing our rights, uh, by the same virtue, the copyright clause uh, granted Congress the power to secure uh, those rights and creative works to protect the value of copyrighted works. And so in terms of some of the evidence of the natural rights view from the founding era, you see in the 1780s, for instance, right uh, close to the lead up to the Constitution, you have the Confederation Congress um, sending a resolution to the states urging them all to pass general copyright laws. And the report language from the Confederation Congress describes copyrights in natural rights terms. And 12 of the 13 original states end up adopting general copyright laws. And a number of them describe copyrights in natural rights uh, terms. So you have, for instance, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1783 says that the legal security of the fruits of author's study and industry is one of the natural rights of all men, there being no property more peculiarly a man's own than that which is produced by the labor of his mind. 
So the natural rights in a person's labor and the fruits of their labor, that grounds our understanding of copyrights. And I think there are some implications from that and is that we ought to reject the idea that, that copyrights is a mere government uh, privilege uh, bestowed on people that government can simply take away or, or curtail when it, when it wishes. Uh, justice just forbids this view. And you know, the natural rights view doesn't prescribe a specific legal code, um, we have a written constitution, we have statutes, we have regulations, and we have judicial decisions, and we have government branches and officers that are charged with doing that. But I do think that it provides some good um, implications, and that is that we ought to strongly favor um, recognizing uh, the rights of creators and, and original works. And um, so I think that means um, resisting ideas, particularly um, calls for judicial reinterpretation of standards that would make it more difficult um, for uh, creators to have their works protected. So if you um, call for novel judicial reinterpretation of established doctrine that um, basically shrinks the scope of what's considered copyrightable or, or suddenly just raises the bar for what's considered original, um, I, I think that does a disservice uh, to the understanding of, of the copyrights clause, the original one. And so, you know, as, as Kurt pointed out, those are arguments and, you know, if, if, if the software industry is so upset, you know, they can make their appeal to Congress. I mean, that's, that's the hard way of going about things, but that's the system we have, we go to Congress. And so in our, in our recent book, which thank you, thank you Ashley for plugging it, um, we, we do argue that there are ways to modernize copyright law. I don't, I don't agree with um, the ones perhaps Google is advocating in this case. Um, but we think there are a number of ways. It is the hard way going to Congress, but that's, that's what we do. We can, we can modernize um, the notice and takedown system for um, online content. Um, that system was established in Section 512 um, in two, 1998 um, when uh, infringement was far fewer. There were far less websites, far less users, and, and, and now the system's overwhelmed. So if we went from a notice and takedown to a notice and stay down decision, that would be very helpful. Um, we could establish a, a system for small claims relief for uh, infringement claims of 30,000 or less. That would be a very helpful thing. And we have legislation in Congress called the CASE Act right now. It passed the House in October and it's uh, awaiting a vote in the Senate. That would be a very helpful thing as well. Uh, another one would be um, to end the terrestrial exemption for um, AM, FM radio broadcasters. They don't have to pay public performance royalties to the owners of sound recordings in the same way that Sirius XM or uh, webcasters like Pandora would have to do. So um, that, that's harmful to the, to the creators and it's an arbitrary kind of uh, special privilege uh, for the broadcasters. So those are the kinds of things that Congress should do. Um, I, I, again, I'll just say that I, I think the uh, Committee for Justice amicus brief was fantastic. It was terrific. And again, thanks for having me on. All right. Had to unmute myself there. Um, so now that Seth has given that sort of broad overview, um, Adam, I'd like to turn it over to you to kind of return a little bit closer to the case now. All right, excellent. Well, thank, thank you, Ashley. And, and I'd just like to reiterate uh, the, and, uh, and uh, reinforce Seth's uh, very, uh, very positive comments, both uh, uh, pre expressing appreciation for inviting me to participate in this event and, and for all the great work that the Committee for Justice does. Um, and so I'm going to kind of meld a little bit uh, the, and, and build off of both of the remarks by Kurt and Seth. Um, as Seth rightly uh, 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 pointed out, um, and, uh, and as he and Randy May have been exploring in their, in their great uh, monographs and articles, you know, the, that um, copyrights and patents are uh, in the Constitution. It's the only place actually in the Constitution proper, even before the Bill of Rights, where you find the word right even used. Um, and of course, it's in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, where Congress is authorized to enact copyright and patent statutes um, to protect these exclusive rights of, of inventors and creators. Um, and, um, and it's not, an, it's not, I don't think, an accident that some of the very first legislation that the first Congress enacted in 1790 was the Copyright Act in 1790 and the Patent Act of 1790. The founders recognized the importance of promoting and, and securing uh, the inventive and creative labors of individuals as a foundation for what would become our growing innovation economy in this, in this country. Um, and history has proved them right. And of course, Congress enacting upon its authorized power to protect copyrights and patents has always been controversial. Intellectual property is, uh, is controversial like all property rights have been controversial. Um, and just like in the United States, there have been populist and socialist movements who have criticized and attacked property rights
markets and factories and in, and in the new types of industrial and, and commercial and capitalistic forms of property that developed in the 19th and early 20th centuries and continue to this day. Um, intellectual property also had its skeptics and its critics um, running throughout, but, the, but as Seth, I think, rightly identified, the understanding and the core justification, both morally and legally for copyright, uh, was implemented by Congress and by courts, and therefore what you largely see is a expand, just like with regular property, as it expands in its protections through the 19th century, recognizing as new forms of valuable assets come into existence um, in the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution with factories and machines and things of that sort that didn't exist before. And people didn't say, oh, well, this is new, so we shouldn't protect this. They said, no, this is a valued asset that derives from the productive labors of individuals and should be protected as property. Um, <clears throat> and so they extended the concept of property, this domain of exclusive use of a valued asset, to these new types of tangible interests. They did the same thing in, in patents and copyrights. Um, and so you see the constant recognition and expansion of this domain of protection um, so all the way through, you know, piano rolls in the late 19th century and early 20th century when courts initially said, well, no, this isn't, this is just dots on a piece of paper. This isn't creative. And, and yet piano rolls produce music. And so Congress had to step in and protect piano rolls and onward and upward all the way up to radio and television, all the new forms of technology that have been innovated as well. And so big surprise um, as the as the digital revolution takes off in the, in the 20th century, right? Um, there was a dispute uh, that was being raised in the courts as to whether copyright should be protected or not. I, I mean, software should be protected or not. Um, and courts were largely split in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and so Congress resolved this, this, this judicial split um, <clears throat> by explicitly enacting an amendment to the 1976 Copyright Act, as Kurt mentioned. Um, it's called the Computer Software Copyright Act of 1980, where the co Congress explicitly states computer programs are copyrightable. Um, and this isn't a shock. Um, you know, coding is a creative act. Code is creative writing. And, I mean, and we know this. I mean, we refer to code as language. Um, and when you talk with coders and programmers, they will tell you they are engaging in a creative enterprise. Um, you know, it's the classic engineer solution, the elegant solution. It's the, even the, they talk in these creative terms, and it's not surprising because um, it is a creative activity, as in all types of things, uh, all types of, of creative endeavors and inventive endeavors. Um, <clears throat> And I don't think it's much of a surprise, just as the protection of property rights in factories and in other types of aspects of the Industrial Revolution correlates with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, reinforcing these productive labors and expanding them and allowing for even greater productive efforts. Um, the, the Congress definitively saying in 1980, copy, uh, code is copyrightable. Um, correlates with the uh, rise of the, uh, what we now call the personal computer revolution, the PC revolution, the separation of hardware from software, and the creation of software as its own viable separate product that's used by consumers on general purpose computers, which is what further drives an explosive growth in the high-tech industry that we've seen over the past 30 or 40 years. Um, and uh, at root in this case, what Google is essentially doing is something uh, that Kurt already mentioned, and I just want to reinforce this, is that, is that Google is essentially asking the Supreme Court to rewrite the, copy, the Computer Software Copyright Act in 1980, which simply states computer programs are copyrightable. It doesn't say, well, we have to differentiate between different types of computer programs. So there's word processors, and there's spreadsheets, and there's operating systems, and then there's um, and then there's APIs, application program interfaces. APIs, those aren't copyright. The, 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 the act does not say that. The legislation does not state that. The legislation says programs are copyrightable. So code is code, as stated by Congress, and therefore code is protected by the copyright, uh, copyright statute. And, and, um, and this is very important because Google's arguments in court that code is not copyrightable or at least the functional type of code that you have in, in, um, in APIs like Java is not copyrightable. Um, and that even if it is, what it did is fair use, actually conflict with its own contemporaneous statements 15, uh, 15 to 20 years ago, when it first began negotiations, first with Oracle and then later with, um, or first with, um, yeah, uh, with, um, um, uh, before uh, Oracle, first with Sun, which first developed Java, and then with later with Oracle. Um, in fact, in 2010, Google engineer Tim Lindholm explicitly stated in an internal uh, uh, email 
to the then, uh, well, founder and then head of uh, Android, uh, uh, Ruben, that, um, quote, we need to negotiate a license for Java under the terms we need, <laughs> end quote. Um, they recognize that this is a protectable um, uh, property right that was owned by Oracle in 2010, that it acquired uh, via the transfer of property rights, that tra property rights can be transferred and it went, when, uh, when, or uh, when Oracle acquired it from, uh, from Sun, when it bought Sun. And, um, and therefore recognized that it needed to license it. Um, and, um, uh, and you don't see anywhere in these early emails and these early statements internally or otherwise from Google them saying, we think this is purely functional. We don't think this is copyrightable. We don't think that, there, this, uh, that, that, we, uh, that, that we don't think we need to respect the copyright here because we think this is fair use or anything of that sort. This is all ex post arguments raised by Google in the litigation after Oracle sued it uh, for copyright infringement and initially also patent infringement, but the patent aspects uh, dropped off, um, uh, you know, to justify what it had done and, and what, uh, what had it actually done. Excuse me, I have a timer set for myself. Uh, what actually had it done? Well, it made a business decision. It decided that it was cheaper and easier uh, to have its uh, 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 to have its software programmers just copy eleven thousand five hundred lines of code than to write th those lines of code itself. In fact, Google admitted this in trial. It explained to the jury that what it did was quote a sound business practice for Google to leverage the existing community of developers unquote in taking the API code uh, and copying it directly. And in other words, this is a classic case of copyright infringement, right? You have direct copying of, 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 of a language, of a computer code. And why did they directly copy it? Because of an existing community of developers who already understood. In other words, there was commercial value in that code. And thus, this is no different uh, to draw an analogy to someone saying, well, there's a massive community of readers who appreciate and already understand Harry Potter. Gosh, I could write my own book about wizards and witches, but that would take a long time and it would be hard. And, I, and there's no community of readers that to, to read my book. So I'll just copy Harry Potter directly. Why shouldn't I? Because, uh, because I need to be able to plug into that community of, 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 uh, of readers. Um, in other words, what, what, uh, what Google is engaging in is something that policy wonks and, and, and IP lawyers refer to as efficient infringement. It made a business decision to infringe an intellectual property right. Um, anyone else historically, courts called this simply piracy. Anyone else would just call this theft, right? This is theft of creative works and, in, uh, and inventive labors of other people simply because it was cheaper and easier for them to do so, so that they could more quickly and easily get a product into the market and make money themselves selling something in the high tech market. So. Um, I'm going to leave it at that, that and we'll, can, uh, we can pick up and hopefully touch on much many more interesting aspects of the case in the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to transition to the discussion session. Um, I have a kind of a question for the panelists um, that I'd like them to start off with, though. Um, so although the court, so the court hasn't um, seen a, cop a major copyright case or really like a strictly a copyright case in a number of decades, really. Um, so it's pretty hard to predict how they might come down here. Um, the closest though recently that we've had um, is on March 24, uh, March 23rd in Allen versus Cooper, um, which is really more of a sovereign immunity case, but the court held that states have sovereign immunity that preclude them from being sued from copyright infringement, um, which is somewhat surprising, or at least I thought it was. Um, but is there anything that you guys see in that decision that might you know, give us some tea leaves to read on you know, whether where the court might come down on this case specifically and what they're thinking might be? If you can unmute yourselves, please. Hurt, did you want to uh, take that question first, or? Um, sure. I mean, I don't want to read too much from it because it was primarily, uh, as as Ashley pointed out, a sovereign immunity case. Um, but you know, given that that there are not a lot of uh, recent uh, cases on point, I guess we we have to read some tea leaves there. Um, you know, I think everyone concedes that we're probably not going to get, or I shouldn't say we, Oracle is probably not going to get uh, Breyer's vote, and I think that you can see that um, in in that earlier case. And um, uh, you know, Thomas is you know probably the among the conservatives, perhaps the one we're least likely to get, and again, you can you can see that in the uh, in the uh, Allen v. Cooper case. Mm 
Well, isn't that, you know, isn't that a bit surprising as we point out in our briefing, we're pointing that Justice Scalia, for example, um, had some words to say about the Copyright Act that I'm sure you guys could reflect on. Yeah, he um, made a point, um, and I, I, I think I sort of paraphrased him earlier, um, which is to say that it's just not a judge's job to look for the best copyright policy. It's a judge's job to interpret the act. Um, again, finding the best copyright policy is, uh, is for Congress to do. And, um, you know, Scalia felt, uh, felt strongly about that. Yeah, this is a, um, <clears throat> this, it's a great question, actually. Um, uh, the, the Supreme Court hasn't addressed the issue of copyrightability of, of uh, computer programs since the uh, uh, Lotus v. Borland case in the, uh, in the, in the early 1990s, um, where um, it split 4-4. Um, and so we didn't get a, um, a decision in that case um, on the scope of, of the protections of, of, of the 1980 uh, Computer Software um, uh, Copyright Act. Um, and as, as far as I'm aware, I mean, this is uh, the, its first fair use, to, its first decision on, on what counts as fair use um, in many, many, many decades. Um, uh, we haven't seen a, 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 you know, a real uh, fair use decision of this sort in this area in a long time. Um, and, uh, but the Allen case, while it's not on this issue in general, as I think, as Kurt said, you know, it, the, the, the decision, the decision is, a, is, a, it can, it might be a little concerning for people who, you know, who are in support of copyright in this and, um, and believe that copyright serves a, a valuable function, um, and reflects underlying, the underlying, um, uh, historical uh, justifications for why we protect it. Uh, um, if only because, uh, you know, Justice Thomas wrote a concurrence um, in, uh, in the Allen case where he indicated that, you know, the scope of uh, even the constitutional status of copyright as a property right is, in his mind is an open question, which was a little surprising um, given the type of historical scholarship done by many scholars like Seth and others um, that have repeatedly shown um, uh, for anyone who, who has uh, inclinations towards uh, originalism in their jurisprudence, such as Justice Thomas, that as an historical matter, within the original public meaning of, of what copyright meant, both at the time of the founding and through the early American Republic, um, that copyright was repeatedly viewed as a property right um, that was rightly protected um, to authors given their creative labors in producing these, these important works, and that, it, and, that it, and that it should receive constitutional protection under the relevant clauses that protect property rights, like the due, clause, due process clause and the takings clause. And I, I'm reminded now that I probably didn't do, uh, with the mention of this being the first uh, fair use case in a long time, that I probably didn't do a, a good enough job of explaining uh, the difference between the copyrightability and fair use issue. It's a two-step process. First, you have to find whether uh, the code in question here was copyrightable. And then even if it is, you have to consider Google's uh, fair use defense. And fair use is just a catch-all for basically cases where you can copy something despite the copyright. So isn't, you know, saying that it was fair use also conceding that it's copyrightable? Is that what you're saying? Well, you wouldn't get to the second part of the, of the, the analysis unless exactly. you, unless it was copyrightable. Yeah. Which is why it's interesting. That's, you know, kind of one of the major questions I think too, was it's code copyrightable. Well, I think, um, you know, a good lawyer will make both, uh, will make mm -hmm. both arguments, but I think um, you have a point there. I think Google, uh, well, Google lost in the federal circuit on copyrightability before it lost on fair use. And I, I think uh, Google probably knows that if it's gonna win here, it'll more likely to be on fair use than on copyrightability. Because again, it's so hard to, to argue that um, declaring code is not copyrightable, but, but all other code is. So um, you've got a point, you know, Google is, uh, probably pinning most of its hopes on unfair use. And, um, and, and just like what Kirk said with respect to its argument about the copyrightability of the software code, it, it proves too much um, since all, all code at root in some way, shape or form is functional. In fact, all language is functional. So in a certain sense, you could be, you know, you know if you took Google's argument about the copyrightability of, of, of uh, or the lack of copyrightability of, of functional language 
uh, to its ultimate conclusion, right? You couldn't copyright, you know, definite particles and, and indefinite particles uh, like the, because uh, there is a, they're just purely functional uh, grammatical terms. Um, they don't, they don't actually uh, have uh, self-standing content. Um, and, uh, and, and they seem to be asking to, the court to be making these type of fine policy-based distinctions about in, in, this, in the computer context with respect to code that we wouldn't do in any, with any other language. Um, but, uh, but it's fair use argument also proves too much, right? I mean, so it's essentially says, well, you know, um, you know, this is functional, so it has to be uh, fair use. So re it reiterates the same point about the lack of, of computer of, of copyrightability because it's just an argument in the alternative. If it loses on the copyrightable argument, its fallback argument is the fair use. But Google's, uh, but it's if the second argument is essentially essentially is well, everybody does this in the industry. Everybody copies code, um, you know, and that you know again that proves too much, right? I mean, if you if 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 you if you if you accept as an argument, well theft of property, everyone starts to do it, therefore we should no longer protect property. That takes us down a very dangerous road of um, it, where, you know, we can start, we can of course start saying, well, you know, the people aren't respecting property rights in, in X area anymore as a cultural norm or as a, or, or as a, as a practice, therefore we shouldn't do it. But also it's false. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, Perhaps uh, software um, coders, um, you know, themselves tend to be IP skeptics culturally, but they work for companies, they are paid salaries by companies who depend upon the properization of, the, of, the, of their productive labors through their business models and producing products and services that they sell in the, uh, to, uh, to consumers in the marketplace with respect to their high-tech products. Um, and so it's just, it, it, it just it, uh, Google has been engaged in a very strate uh, campaign of strategic litigation for many years to expand fair use. And this is part and parcel of this broader argument because it's trying to essentially have the exception swallow the rule, the rule being copyright protection and the exception being fair use. It's really trying to make fair use the dominant uh, uh, default presumption with the minor little exceptions for copyright. And that just turns the whole framework on its head. As someone who uh, was in the computer industry before I went to law school, it's definitely true that um, coders um, you know, tend to be anti IP. I can't even say exactly why, but it's sort of, if you want an analogy, it's, it's the way a lot of people feel about software. Um, you know, they're per the average consumer doesn't feel particularly guilty um, uh, getting free, you know, copying somebody else's uh, software, um, a friend's software and not paying the license fee. And there's a similar attitude when it comes to coders, which is, yeah, I know te technically it's protected, but you know, Everyone does it, why shouldn't I? Yeah, I think it's important though to emphasize, I mean, this is a very different ballgame. Now, now that this case is in front of the Supreme Court, we're not talking policy or you know what ought to be fair use. Like, well, it should have been fair use is not, uh, you know, not an argument you logically take in front of the Supreme Court. That's not you know, the court's function. Um, this you know, is an appellate court. It's kind of, um, for lack of a better analogy, it's kind of like you know, Google stole like, the back porch of a house and said, well, the law that said don't steal houses didn't say don't steal the back porch of houses. And it should be public property anyway, because we think that. Um, well, you might think that, but the court's not the right place to consider that. Um, one other broader underlying issue um, I'd like you guys to touch on a little bit is, um, you know, in this case, and we see this in a lot of other cases, not in the copyright context necessarily, but privacy, whatever else, in which, you know, one side is trying to make distinctions to the court based on what type of technology is saying, oh, well, an API is much different than the rest of code, or, you know, um, the, the CSLI data is very different than other types of metadata. Um, what, what do you guys make of that kind of general trend of making these distinctions in the law based on the types of technologies or at least attempting to do so? Well, again, they sort of, Google kind of has to do that here. Um, and it is part of their, their uh, larger effort to sort of chip away at the uh, copyrightable of software code. But again, you know, just so our audience knows, APIs, um, that's just a synonym for basically declaring code. And again, if you were gonna copy anything, that's what you would copy because that's what the developers work with. Um, you know, beneath that declaring code is implementing code that the developer doesn't, doesn't really even care about. He just cares about the interface, whether you want to call it declaring code or an API. So that's what you would want to copy. And so very conveniently, you know, Google has developed the argument that uh, what it wanted to copy is 
is what it says can't be uh, protected. Yeah, and I mean, so Sassy, you've written a good bit about, you know, the need to modernize copyright law, which I do think there's, you know, general need to do that for Congress to do that. Um, but of course, uh, you know, the counter argument to what we're saying that the court shouldn't do it as well, Congress isn't going to do it. It's an election year. They're kind of preoccupied um, and they're not great at passing legislation these days anyway. Um, so how do we achieve this? Um, and some want to go, you know, the more judicial activist route um, through, through the court, which we don't agree with, but like, you know, from a practical perspective, of how can this be achieved? Um, maybe not, you know, related specifically to fair use or APIs, but what what's kind of on the horizon with IP um, modernization right now? Well, I mean, it's in terms of expanding um, or, or dealing with modern technology, I mean, I think the Copyright Act at least tries to sort of anticipate that future technologies or future um, uh, things may arise and those should give rights. I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of the, uh, the natural rights outlook that we have is wherever you have someone who labors and, and creates something to which they attach value in, in that thing, that, that, should, that could you know, potentially form the basis um, for, for copyright protection. So um, I don't have anything in particularly in mind, but I think we just need to have that um, front and center in our thinking as, as we develop new technologies and new platforms and, and new venues that there could be new forms and new ways of creating value and, and we need to see that those are protected. Right. And I should add, um, you know, even though Congress doesn't move fast, if you look at the various uh, revisions of the Copyright Act, it's always tried to expand what's covered to include new technology. It's, it's always taken a let's cover everything expressive um, attitude which is why it's it's sort of um, you know against congressional intent for Google to now be arguing for a very constrictive view of of what's covered. And, um, and I, I just want to reiterate the point that uh, that Kurt made at the very beginning of our, of our event that you know we have had in fact an extremely vibrant um, uh, uh, software industry and high tech industry more generally with explosive economic growth, explosive innovation and, and, and creativity um, in ways that, you know, people could not have predicted even 10 years ago. Um, and this has occurred un, uh, under the protection um, and, and uh, uh, with reliable and effective copyrights and even, even in patents up until starting about 10 years ago in these various areas um, of, of, of producing new value in this space. Um, and, you know, so you hear a lot of, you know, this, the doom and gloom, the sky's going to fall if we protect this, oh, they're going to shut things down. And in fact, in fact, it's the exact opposite. Um, you know, that, that's just the fact that, that that argument contradicts the reality. I mean, Oracle had multiple different types of licenses. It was very willing to license uh, um, uh, uh, Java, just like Sun was. Um, and, um, and in fact, Google took what was essentially, um, you know, uh, a very uh, um, uh, uh, um, licenses that were made Java very open and accessible, and proprietized it and closed it off by 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 making it solely usable in the Android system, um, and so its own arguments contradict themselves. And I would also just like to put a put a a, a, a fine uh, point on the fair use argument. I mean. Even if you want to argue, even if you concede a foundational point that well, some software co uh, coders um, do take other code, you know, without permission, this can't be fair use because it is done because they took the code explicitly for a commercial purpose. They were developing a commercial product, the Android operating system. I have an Android phone. I know that they, they succeeded in developing it, and that is the one thing that fair use is not supposed to uh, uh, allow for. If you are actually taking someone else's work for the purposes of selling a product that you are another product you want to make and sell in the marketplace, that is not fair use. But fair use is like you know one-off uses in educational contexts, quoting something in a newspaper or in a book review or things like this. This is, fair use is not supposed to justify commercial activities, not just commercial activities, but commercial activities by multi-billion dollar multinational corporations that have, more, that have more than enough money in the bank and probably spend more money on a, uh, in one day on, the, on coffee for their employees than they would have had to pay at all at any point in time for a license to use the, the, right. the Java. And by the way, some of the license agreements were, were free. You didn't have to pay mm -hmm. anything. Um, no, but Adam's point is, is an important one. What, um, you know, what Google did here is blatant copying. It would be the equivalent of 
you know, not just copying passages um, from Harry Potter, but, but copying the entire book, um, the exact cover, and then selling a million copies of it to make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have about a little under 15 minutes left. Um, if any of you have some final thoughts and then um, also any Q&A, like I said, the Q&A um, function on Zoom where you type in the question is open or I can open up the floor at the very end and you can um, either raise your hand via the Zoom function um, or um, chime in via your um, on Zoom portal. Um, I can unmute you if you'd like to, if anyone would like to speak. Final thoughts? Yeah, I'll take, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Um, the natural rights arguments, um, it, it, it's kind of a, um, I wouldn't call it a spectrum, but there, there's some variations in how people have formulated the arguments over time. And, and um, you know, when it comes to a case like um, Google versus Oracle, uh, I think there's clearly um, creative labor involved, uh, value attached, the rights there. Um, if, if you're like in the, in the CF, um, CFJ, um, brief really does a um, good job of, of giving a, a true Lockean kind of argument um, about that. I probably would probably think of more of a slightly modified view, not in the sense that I agree on the, on the labor part and there's the, there's the creativity and the right attaches, um, but I, I don't necessarily think of um, a computer program um, drawing on drawing out of a, a stock of common property of ideas that way. And, and some, some natural rights thinkers, um, although, although it has a substantial pedigree, including the great Mr. Locke, some of them think that's not necessarily a step we need to go to, that there was an idea of a common stock of property for all mankind, and you mix your labor with it, and then it becomes yours. Um, the, the idea instead would be, well, you know, a property is more of an exclusive um, kind, kind of um, ownership concept. And the idea is there, there could be other stuff out there, but it simply belongs to nobody. And, and so you have the, 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 uh, the creators at um, Oracle or, or formerly Sun Microsystems. Um, they came up with this, these ideas, you know, yes, they drew on ideas, but I mean, th th these were things that, um, you know, concrete expressions that belonged to nobody. Um, it was their own inventiveness, their own creativity, and, and they came up with that. And um, we're, we're going on a similar track and end up with it with a similar um, result. Um, I think the, the brief is persuasive. I think Oracle's case is persuasive. And, and I'll just add in that I, I was surprised um, by Justice Thomas's um, opinion, um, suggesting it was an open question on the 14th Amendment and whether that's property. Um, whether you're talking about just the due process clause or the um, 14th Amendment in general, um, I, my, my first reaction is, well, well, why wouldn't it be considered property? And you think of, for instance, the privileges or immunities clause in, in, in uh, the 14th Amendment. Um, you know, copyrights come from the Constitution. It is a privilege or immunity of citizenship in the United States. And we actually saw a dispute over this, um, a minor one, uh, in the lead up to the Civil War. Um, you had uh, Jefferson Davis, of all people, had um, applied for a patent that one of his slaves, an invention he had made, and, and the patent office denied the patent because they claimed his slave was not a citizen of the United States. And then in 1862, you had Attorney General Edwin Bates um, essentially uh, reverse the policy on that and, and, and um, claim that um, copyrights and patent rights would be available um, to, to everyone as, as citizens of the United States and, and not be limited to, to white people. So um, I, I, think, I think any, it's, it's, I don't think it's actually even a hard, hard question or a hard call. I think the evidence is there, it's abundant and the logic is clear and abundant. And I should add, um, since not everyone in the audience is a lawyer, that uh, the reason the 14th Amendment matters is primarily because it comes after the 11th. The 11th granted sovereign immunity. And so the idea is that if you can put it under the 14th Amendment, then, then that was meant to, to pierce um, sovereign immunity. Um, I also wanted to address, you know, sort of this idea that some people, including um, perhaps Justice Thomas, somehow see um, uh, copyrightable material as being not, not fully uh, property in the sense that, you know, uh, more physical property is. And that, you know, probably comes from the fact that it is relatively easy to copy. I mean, when I was a kid, it was, you know, hard to copy a book. There were no e-books. Um, it was hard to copy music. I mean, it was on a, a CD or, or, or vinyl, but it's always been easy to, um, you know, to copy um, software and to copy code. 
and so I think that ease of copying has made people view it as less than full property when all the same, not just the constitutional arguments, but the practical arguments for copyright. There's, you want to protect it so that people have the incentive to innovate. Um, you know, as, as the same practical arguments as other types of property. Um, and I think, um, you know, the very fact that copying tends to uh, make erode that, um, the ease of copying, I should say, is every reason to, you know, make sure that the copying that Google engaged in is not, um, you know, is not allowed um, because we don't want to further erode um, the protections that the founding fathers intended for, uh, for intellectual property. Yeah. And so, um, and, I, and, I, and I just wanted to offer quickly just a, um, a few comments to, uh, as, as the kids might say, Rick today, riff off of what uh, Kurt and Seth just, uh, um, just said, um, that, you know, there, there's a real, um, uh, the, the importance of recognizing the framing function of the classic kind of Lockean justification for intellectual property is really, is really key. Um, if one embraces more the kind of the what is the dominant conventional wisdom today that this is purely a matter of utilitarian social policy about whether we protect intellectual property or not, it really orients one towards both conceptually and, and, and normatively towards kind of the perspective that Justice Thomas and others and Justice Breyer have that, you know, that this is just kind of open-ended freewheeling social policy about whether the government is going to protect some people and hurt other people, right? So, Essentially, you know, you know, what, you know, the copyright becomes on par with, you know, the, the recent bailout that the federal government uh, enacted in response to all the shutdowns and quarantines. It just becomes a pure policy judgment um, where you're just weighing all the different costs and benefits. And, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, that is not what our country is founded upon. Um, and, one, and one shouldn't identify the fact that or, rec or, or say that, well, you know, I can find statements in um, the, uh, the historical record where people indicate that this is what benefits society, uh, that that is proof that this means that this is a utilitarian uh, justification for our, our, our IP system because, um, because natural rights foundations, natural rights are, were embraced by Locke and the founders, not just because they were right, because, because they also worked. They, they produced a flourishing, happy society. You know, Thomas Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence, you know, it's the job of the government to protect our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Thomas Jefferson was not a utilitarian. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, it, it, the, the two go hand in hand. And, uh, and the Supreme Court has actually recognized this to its credit. Uh, Justice Ginsburg in, in the Golan decision from about 10 years ago recognized that Kind of utilitarianism and natural rights justifications for uh, copyright complement each other was her term that she uh, uh, recognized in, in the historical record. Um, and I would go even stronger and say actually the foundational justification is actually the natural rights justification. And on derivative questions like, well, do you you know do you protect for you know life of author plus ninety years or life of author plus seventy years or you know do you, to or you know how do you define the particular doctrinal details of you know, of assignment requirements or licensing requirements. Well, yeah, there you then will want to take into account kind of economic issues and utilitarian issues and these kind of derivative specific issues, but kind of the foundational questions, is code copyrightable? What is fair use? I mean, that is exactly what we should be looking to in terms of framing these questions in terms of the foundational justification for all property rights in this country, both intangible and intangible goods. And most property now is intangible um, that uh, as, we protect at core, the default rule is we protect at core the, the fruits of the productive labors um, of individuals. And productive labors are creative and inventive labors. And um, in fact, tangible property itself is rooted in inventive and creative labors, right? There can't be farms without the invention of plows and, and, and farming techniques and methods of farming and all the other technologies that were patented and the communication of those technologies through copyrighted books and instruction manuals and other things. And so I think that if, as long as we retain the perspective of that perspective and that, that theoretical framing, I think that this is a very easy case. It's only a hard case if you complicate it, you throw in a lot of unnecessary uh, arguments and, and do a lot of hand waving, which is exactly what Google's doing, obviously, because that's what it needs to do in order to, in order to win. Yeah, speaking yeah, of these more utilitarian, um, these more utilitarian arguments, Seth's um, reference to the Civil War era case reminds me of a Abe Lincoln quote, quote which I um, am kind of paraphrasing here. I think it's, um, I believe, the man who made the corn should eat the corn. 
Um, so I think this sums that up pretty um, well from a more practical perspective to wrap things all back together there. Um, let me just add that I, you know, Adam's point about, you know, um, more and more property is in intangible is one of the arguments for why this case is so important. Um, you know, in a world in which arguably there's more wealth in the tech industry than anywhere else, um, uh, you know, maybe we could get away, I uh, shouldn't say get away with, but the economic damage from not protecting intangible intellectual property is greater now than, it, than it's ever been. I also wanted to just clarify that I've hardly given up on uh, Justice Thomas. I hope I didn't give that uh, impression. Uh, Justice Breyer, of course, to ev everything is policy to him, so that may be a different story. But um, Justice Thomas is a strong constitutionalist, and once he focuses on this case, um, I'm still uh, quite optimistic that he'll uh, that he'll see it Oracle's way. Um, of course, you know, intellectual property um, cases don't break down in the you know in the easy ideological way that a lot of other issues before the court do. I mean, I guess we'll find out soon, or, or maybe not even that soon. Uh, another thing we didn't mention is that, unlike a bunch of the cases that were postponed, but will be argued by phone in May, uh, uh, Google v. Oracle won't be argued to the fall. So, you know, it's possible we won't have a decision until, until next spring. Absolutely. And I think you make an important point that, you know, the diminishment of intellectual property rights diminishes all property rights. And I think that kind of um, is, goes to the core of what we're getting at here. Um, I think we're about out of time here. I'd like to thank all the panelists for being kind enough to uh, tune in this morning and um, have this conversation. Thanks for coming out. Great discussion. Um, both of you have, or well, all three of you, I say both of you as I work with Kurt, um, but all three of you have um, produced some really great work in these topics. I'd encourage anyone in the audience to read. Um, if anyone in the audience has any follow-up questions, um, if you could send them to me, if you don't know the panelists personally, my email address is abaker at committeeforjustice.org and I'll make sure that they get them. Um, I know Adam has to go teach a class, so we're running out of time here, but thank you to everyone who tuned in and have a great day. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Thank, Thank you, you, Ashley. Thank you, Seth.